producers are very busy. Labor is hard to find. So anything we can do to help them simplify management generally is well received and, and I think helps their business be more effective. So- Welcome to the Beef Podcast Show. My name is Dr. Stephanie Hansen. I'm a feedlot nutritionist at Iowa State University. Our guest today is Dr. Warren Rushi, who is an assistant professor in extension beef feedlot management at South Dakota State University. He earned his PhD from SDSU in 2021, his MS in 1992 from Kansas State, and his BS from South Dakota State University in 1990. Prior to becoming a professor at SDSU, Warren was an SDSU extension field specialist with both expertise in cow-calf and feedlot for 10 years. His research and extension interests are focused on integration of crops with cattle feeding, beef cattle management, and production risk management. So welcome to the Beef Podcast Show, Warren. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And so both of us being in the feedlot space, we definitely run into each other now and then at these meetings. Yes, we do. And uh, so it's great to have this, you know, this kind of uh, conversation and hopefully we uh, can provide some information for the audience that will be useful and help them with uh, their businesses. Absolutely. So we like to start with just giving the guests an opportunity to tell us a little bit about your story. So tell us how you got involved in the beef industry and how that led to your position today at SDSU. So I, I tell people, and in fact, I use this slide on my interview for this position. It all started with a steer, uh, 4-H calf when I was eight years old. And and I've always been fascinated by the beef industry, uh, livestock in general, really. Uh, I've just been a, I was a livestock kid growing up. Um, you know, the the worst form of torture that my parent, my dad could give me was to make me go sit on a tractor, um, fixing fence, uh, lambing ewes, feeding fat lambs, checking cattle. That was fun. Uh, so I, I've I've taken kind of a a very winding career path. I started off after you know your listeners probably noticed that there was a really long gap between the master's degree and the PhD degree. In between, I did a lot of different things. I was uh, in county extension for a while. Uh, then I had the opportunity to go back to our family's operation in Kingsbury County, South Dakota. That's located in the east central part of the state. We had a diversified crop and livestock business, uh, row crops. We had a cow-calf operation, custom backgrounded cattle. Uh, through a series of events, uh, my wife and I came to the conclusion that I needed to make a career change. Uh, that coincided with when South Dakota State reorganized their extension system. And I, I rejoined uh, the university as a field specialist, first in cow-calf. Uh, then that turned into uh, extension responsibilities for feedlot. And in, in that part of that, I was... Uh, convinced that it that I was not in fact too old to pursue a PhD degree and so I started that in uh, 2016 finished it up in 2021 and now I've moved into the faculty role so you know I've always been like I said I've been a you know I'm, I'm a livestock kid at heart uh, I get excited talking about and thinking about what we can do with uh, uh, improving uh, livestock and beef cattle production in particular how I can use those skills that I have to improve our state. Uh, And now most recently, the part that really gets me excited is mentoring grad students. Um, That was the part of the job. I did not expect I would love as much as I do, Uh, but you know, they're, they, their, their energy, their enthusiasm is infectious. Uh, You know, I know Stephanie, you've, you've interviewed Dr. Smith. Um, You know, we're a kind of a, we're a fun group. Um, There's a lot going on and it's really an exciting place to work. Well, that's really a great background, Warren, with the diversified crop and uh, livestock background. And I think a lot of us who grew up in some association with a family farm had one piece or another that we kind of went towards, right? It was either we really loved the row crop side or we really loved the cat, you know, the animal side. So that's a, that's a neat place. So actually, I want to start with talking about your graduate student mentoring, because I think that's one of the things I always tell people of the many, many things that we are not trained in during our graduate student experiences to be faculty members. Mentoring is right at the top, right? So we either see good mentoring or we see bad mentoring and we say, don't do that. Um, I'm curious what you've looked for for resources and kind of working to be a better graduate mentor. And obviously you and Zach are like, a kind of like a really fun pairing of each other. I think you have very different strengths. So that's probably really great for your students. 
Yeah. So to speaking to, you know, how Dr. Zach and I have learned to work together is what it's turning into, I think is at least unofficially, I'm going to take the lead on master's students and he'll take more of the lead on PhD students. Um, I think the fact that, you know, call it getting older or more mature, but let's say you will use more mature is helped me in terms of, you know, helping the, the younger, you know, the, making helping those students make that transition from their undergrad to the master's degree um, i have a daughter that's a basically the same age so i kind of know where they're at know kind of how they're thinking and then we where zach is really skilled on the you know really he's really a true scientist researcher uh, and can help those phd students take that next leap uh, so from that standpoint you know we've we kind of divide things up unofficially that way. Uh, the students will tell us, well, we've got a mom and a dad and they tell me I'm the mom. Uh, so I don't know what to think about that some days, but, you know, and it is funny. There'll be, there'll be times where, you know, they'll come to me for something or they'll come to him. And thankfully we're on the pretty much the same page. They can't really play us off against each other. You know, in terms of, you know, you're right. I, you know, there's no course in how to be a mentor. I, I'm fortunate. I've got a, a long list of life experiences I can draw from. I was also very lucky. I had some excellent mentors coming up that, you know, I didn't necessarily realize all they were teaching me at the time, but people like Dr. Larry Cora, Dr. Bob Cochran, Dr. Dave Harmon, uh, when, for my days at Kansas state, uh, then, you know, here as a young extension agent, um, you know, names that maybe aren't widely recognized outside of South Dakota or in the beef world, but people like Leon Reggie, um, you know, or Bob Taller on the swine side, um, extension agents that I respected like Bob Scher, Chuck Langner, uh, you know, those are the folks that really kind of shaped me in terms of how to be a professional, how to, um, how to reach out and learn from stakeholders. And then I try to pass on those lessons to uh, our students. And then I throw in some you know, real world experiences in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm I've actually managed cows uh, where how much money I got to spend depended upon the decisions that we made. So I try to pass those things on as well. Uh, and it's, you know, and I don't know if I'm, You'd have to ask the students how well I'm doing, and it probably depends on the day. Um, I've joked with them that uh, my father's name is Herb, and I've told them that, you know, when things aren't perhaps going quite right, especially like when we're loading cattle or some other things, I've I've told them, I said, guys, you keep this up. You're going to meet Herb, and you're not going to like him. <laughs> it's so far, uh, Herb has been kept in this, kept locked up in the closet where that part of my personality belongs. But, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a fun experience. I, I like watching them grow and, uh, you know, when the light bulbs start clicking on and they start, all right, this is starting to make sense. That's, that's the part of the process that's fun. Absolutely. I agree. I love seeing when a graduate student gets it almost as much as I love seeing them being willing to put in the struggle before they get it. Cause that's really when they learn. Yeah. I, you know, and I've, I've told them, I said, there's going to be a time, you know, it, it happens every time when, you know, there's going to be a struggle and you got to power through it. There's going to be a time when you and I are going to have a hard conversation and neither one of us are going to enjoy it, uh, but it's part of it. And, you know, they need to worry when I quit pushing them uh, then, which, which has not happened. But if it hap if, you know, if I've decided that, you know, they're just not invested, uh, that's when they need to worry. Uh, so it, when I'm, you know, pushing them to think a little more, um, you know, dig a little deeper. It's because I know they can uh, and because I, I know where the payoff is going to be. Absolutely. Okay. So we are uh, moving into the second half of May, 2023, as we're recording this here today. And uh, summer is barreling towards us, right? Um, good things and bad things about that. I'm really glad to see my pasture grass tall enough to be able to kick the cows out here in the last couple of weeks. Tired of mowing my lawn already, but one of the things we know is coming fast is the heat waves that we traditionally get here in this part of the country. I remember last year, so in 2022, we were doing a disease challenge study and we trucked a group of cattle in April 
like third week of April. And I swear they had hypothermia. It was 32 and raining the whole time. And three weeks later, we brought group two over and it was 95 degrees the day that we trucked him. And they got way sicker in that second group than in the first group. So we know that heat has all kinds of negative impacts on cattle health and performance. So I think this is an area that you're pretty passionate about, thinking about environmental challenges. Yeah, you know, it, it sort of comes with the territory growing up in South Dakota. Uh, you know, I mean, we were, I talked to someone last week who said they still had snow in their trees. Um, you know, and, and I'm thinking it might be gone now, but, you know, it wasn't that long ago we were fighting blizzards. And very soon, depending on what happens, we may be dealing with heat stress. And, you know, so that that transition, like you just talked about, where it goes from cool to moderate to hot can happen so fast for us. And where where we end up having trouble is our cattle haven't had a chance to adapt yet. Um, we were as we were visiting off air, uh, you know, the rest of the grad students are finishing, uh, taking an interim weight on some cattle and those cattle aren't shed off yet. You know, they're still carrying winter coat. Uh, you know, if it gets warm, you know, and, eat, and warm is relative high eighties, uh, with some humidity is going to be a challenge for some of these cattle. So one of the things I I've taken on is kind of a big part of my extension program is helping producers manage that environmental and heat stress risk either through you know we can do things like either on the structural side either building shades and so forth or we can look at management practices such as you know are we going to do sprinklers uh, or how are we managing feed deliveries are there some feed additives that we can work work with you know so using that kind of a two-pronged approach to help them get them and their cattle through some of these uh, stressful periods so we can avoid performance and or mortality losses absolutely when i was moving cows last night to a new pasture i noticed that you know here we are third week of may and my cows still have a lot of fuzz right they have a lot of winter hair still and they're starting to lose some of it um, but they're plenty conditioned already, so they get warm even when it's in the high 70s with some hum humidity. So the calves are out grazing and the two cows were standing in the shade going, oh, it's a little warm. <laughs> yes. So I think I remember correctly that you've done a survey for producers recently, right? Thinking, kind of asking some questions about heat stress. Do you want to tell us about that? Sure. Uh, so we did the, the actual survey work. Uh, it's been five years ago now already, but we surveyed cattle feeders in South Dakota, Minnesota, and Northeast Nebraska. Uh, this was a USDA grant that actually I inherited. Uh, the team that wrote the grant, um, by the time, shortly after they wrote, you know, that, you, you know how these things sometimes work, uh, people moved on. And so it ended up being, you know, the only people left on the, the only person left on the original team was uh, Dr. Alfredo Di Constanzo at the University of Minnesota. So he and I worked together. We recruited some assistance from the University of Nebraska, and we went out to about 45 or so feedlots in those three states. And we, what we were trying to get was ask them some very open-ended questions about what are you doing now for heat stress? What would you like to do? Uh, how, how, how well has it worked? What's your general assessment of uh, what things are working for you uh, in terms of managing heat stress? And one of the real key themes that came out of that was at least the in that region, the, what people were most interested in using uh, was some kind of shade structure, whether that's one in an open yard or a building. And I think what it comes down to is, uh, you know, I, I called it that's a set and forget strategy. You put it out there, cattle use it if they need to or want to. Um, I don't have to make any decisions that day in terms of, well, do I, what, should we run sprinklers today? How often, when should we start? Uh, do we cut feedback or not? You know, or do we use this feed additive or not? You know, there's a lot of different um, decisions with other strategies that need to be made uh, with shades or buildings. Uh, all we have to do is decide to buy them one time. And if they're a temporary structure, make sure they're out there. Uh, and so the other theme, and it's not directly related to the heat stress, but something else I've been noticing is that producers are very busy, labor is hard to find. So anything we can do to help them simplify management 
generally is well received and, and I think helps their business be more effective. So with that theme, that was one of the reasons why we thought it came out very clearly in our survey results was that shades were deemed the most effective and also the ones they were most desiring to implement, um, which is a bit surprising considering as far north as we are, uh, that you know, we don't see many shades in you know the parts of the country like Southwest Kansas, Southern Plains, where solar radiation is more of an issue. We actually, you know, if you looked at their survey results, our producers were more apt to want to use them than they were. And I think some of that has to do with our that abrupt transition that we have uh, and also the humidity loads that we have. So that was one of the things that came out. Um, I was just going to jump in there before we changed um, gears from shade. Was there any types of shade structures or kind of like um, themes that you saw with that? Yeah, not exactly. And we didn't dig down into that kind of level of detail as, you know, did you want center posts or, you know, there, we did ask, but it was, there were so many different variations that it was really hard to interpret. And I, I tried to make life simple for myself as well. And I had a time crunch on this. So we didn't, uh, we just really broke it down into shades or not shades. Uh, the, you know, the building is the, you know, and that's the building part of that is somewhat of a unique aspect for South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa. Um, you know, so that was, we put those two together to a certain extent. You know, there's more than one shade isn't the only reason to put up a building, but when specifically asked about each stress, uh, that was one of the things they had uh, indicated they were interested in adopting was if it was either shade structures or a building. And so from that standpoint, we sort of lumped them together a little bit is that they were looking for something to take solar radiation off their cattle. So kind of a related question. I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Would you say that most of the cattle that you saw at those feedlots were black hided? So I've been struggling with this a little bit, right? So as we have more concerns with heat stress and solar radiation, right, the, 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 obvious thing, if shade is not an option, is to make those cattle not be black, right? Because of the obvious solar radiation issues. Now, when it's minus 20, and they would like to get as much solar radiation as they can on those days when they get out there, you know, there might be a flip side to that. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on kind of the contradiction between selecting, you know, having black hided cattle so that we can capture some of those CAB premiums or even certain plants like we have national beef here at Tama, they won't take anything that's anything other than black hided. I mean, I can barely squeeze something by that has a little bit of white on its face. And, uh, and, and in South Dakota, Demcota has the same buying, pre buying preferences also. Uh, interestingly, there was at least one of the feedlots I surveyed that did make a conscious effort to try to have their black cattle marketed uh, no later than early July, uh, because of those same reasons. They recognized that the lighter colored hat cattle um, tolerated tolerated the, the summer conditions better. I, I'm I'm a breed agnostic. Um, I I as long as they're good and make money, I don't care what they are. I can tell you our experience. You know, last summer last summer was tough. Um, at Brookings, we were feeding all Charlotte cross cattle. I don't know if they ever missed a beat. We never worried about them. In our sister facility, south of Sioux Falls near Beersford, uh, they happen to all be black. Um, we got along okay, but uh, our technician had to work really hard in terms of sprinkling, keeping on top of things, trying to keep cattle on feed. Um, Zach and I told ourselves we weren't going to feed black cattle in the summer again. And if you go to there right now, the pens are full of black cattle. And that's part of the dilemma on this is, you know, we can say we wanted, you know, I'm going to feed reds and whites, but when it came time to procure the cattle we needed for the study, uh, what was most widely available and, and available when we needed them were black. So, you know, there's a little bit of a, you know, push pull issue going on. And so I don't think we're going to suddenly switch the the entire beef industry seems to have say we like all kinds but we like the black maybe a little bit better i don't we're not going to switch that overnight and so one of our tasks then is all right if we're going to be feeding black cattle how then do we best manage those to provide the best animal care we can to minimize our risk but you're right uh, there is a there is a difference and if i had my preferences 
uh, in those areas that are more heat stress prone, uh, or if I knew I had pens that were more challenging, I would certainly want to prefer to prioritize something other than black hide in those instances. Right. Okay. So we've talked about shade. You started to talk a little bit about sprinklers there too. What else did you see in your survey? So we, you know, we asked about, um, you know, there's you know, the things like the feed additives and so forth and, and didn't really have any kind of clear direction. It was, uh, you know, some of them, it worked really well and other places it didn't same with things like bedding in some places it worked well and other places they hated it. One of the concerns that came up and it's no surprise on the sprinkling avenue was the biggest drawback was we are now making pens wet, uh, which, you know, if we overdo it, we create mud, and that was a drawback. Um, one of the things that, you know, is easy to overlook, but, you know, when you look at the big picture, and it was good to see, is that every place we went did something to mitigate heat stress, whether that, and it may have been as simple of as, a, as we simply avoid handling cattle when it's hot, uh, and, you know, which you know, by itself is critically important, or, you know, they do things like we're going to provide extra water tanks or extra monitoring. They all did something. And in general, all of them said what they were doing was successful. They I didn't, we did not run across, um, you know, any kind of any, respondents that said, boy, we've really had a problem. Uh, they've all said, you know, we've got it under control, you know, to a certain extent, this is like, you know, other weather ex emergencies are extreme. It's under control until we get that, you know, that perfect heat storm, so to speak, where, you know, everything falls apart. Uh, and we, you know, but so we try to have the place pieces in place to control that. But um, the, we did have, you know, some of our feed yards were uh, doing things like adjusting feed deliveries, um, shifting more towards the afternoon. Um, I'd have to look back, but I suspect that was probably more common in the larger larger yards. Uh, you know, for some of the fa farmer feeders, uh, labor and logistics become a real issue. And, you know, that's, you know, that's a challenge in those kind of systems. The other thing that came out, and it ended up spinning off a, an additional resource that we weren't really expecting, is uh, when we ask people, what are your triggers? What makes you decide, oh, it's time to do something? A lot of cases, it's what is the weather like today, which certainly works, but it takes away the opportunity to be more proactive. And so we thought there'd be an opportunity or a, or a niche or a place for some kind of alert system or a tool that people could use. And so what I did is we, we had some resources from this grant. Uh, we've got a team in place with the Ag Biosystems folks that have a network of weather stations across South Dakota that are already collecting the data. Uh, and so I gave them the formula that Dr. Mader developed for the comprehensive cattle comfort index, and we created a livestock stress tool. And, and you, primarily for heat stress, it also works for cold stress as well. Uh, we didn't know this at the time, but, you know, there's a fairly limited number of mesnet stations in South Dakota, uh, but they found some other fe funding sources uh, through the Corps of Engineers. Uh, Corps is very concerned about what goes on with water and drainage in the Missouri River Basin. So they've come up with a pro an, an approach to put out a lot of money, to put out a lot of mesonet stations, which also means we're going to be able to provide a lot of heat stress data across South Dakota. So you know, the it, what started off as just something we noticed is going to turn into a really effective tool for the livestock producers in our state. So is that something that they're able to like follow so that they get an automatic alert if it's like, you know, 24 hours ahead of time, it looks like hot weather or cold weather is coming your way? Right now, we don't have the the push uh, components set up. And I, I what I need to I need to sit down with some of our technical team and uh, because I don't know how to make that happen. Uh, but I think we've got people in the team that can. Uh, so right now, it's something they'd have to go to. Uh, but it does have a 48 hour forecast uh, as part of the report, which is different than, you know, there's other places that have, you know, the same mesonet systems and, and report a livestock stress index. What to my knowledge, ours is the, 
the only one that provides up to 48 hours advance warning. So that's one of the things that I, and, and especially as we get a greater density of stations, uh, one of the things I'd like to incorporate is some way to, uh, people could uh, sign up to get alerts as to when that's coming. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it's a sad story, but obviously you remember the blizzard of 2013 that happened up in your part of the country. Um, I use that in my advanced nutrition class every fall. I have them read just a popular press article about, I think it's called understanding what happened. Um, and then I have the students read that and we read that after our energy lecture. And so then, um, you know, we spend that whole kind of half hour, first half of class talking about, um, well, it's, it's actually an interesting exercise. They actually do things about like, you know, how do you feel about this thing happening and what are, you know, why did it happen? And so they talk about the fact that like the cattle were wet and they, you know, because it rained before it snowed. And so talk about insulation and all kinds of uh, low energy consumptions, right? Because they were still in summer pastures and, and things like that. And one of the questions they always ask is, why didn't they go get the cattle and move them? Didn't they know a blizzard was coming? And so I'm trying to explain to these kids from the Midwest that like the cows are right there, right? Like not very far away. It's like, these are extensive systems, right? It's not like you had the logistics to get the semis lined up and bring them home. And then you didn't have feed resources. All of that to say, I think the variability is what kills, I mean, variability is what kills cows, right? Whether it's the cold side or the hot side. And in that particular instance, they didn't know it was going to be a blizzard. I mean, I, you know, they, there was a, there was a storm forecast, but you know, this is the end of September and we just thought it's just going to be a, you know, a, a fall rain. I mean, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of, I actually, I spent a couple days out there after in the aftermath of that winter storm Atlas because counties needed help identifying and marking cattle carcasses in the road right away. Because they had hired logging trucks out of the hills to come get them and take them to central burial locations, so I spent two days riding around with some people out there. And I got to tell you, that was the hard, one of the hardest two days I've ever spent in my professional career. Now, I, there was a young producer. I mean, they were they were dragging them out you know, ten at a time from the out in these pastures out to the roadside. Uh, it was really tough, and but. I've talked to then other ranchers, other producers who weren't effective and to an individual, they all said, you know, if I'd had that same scenario coming at me, we wouldn't have brought them in either given what they knew because no one knew it was going to be two feet of snow. It was, uh, it was incredible. Um, and so that was, yeah, I, I mean, that, and, and there was a lot of theories on, well, was it this, you know, people thought they drowned and it was all kinds of, but, you know, I think you and your students are on the right track. It was just simply you know, a severe case of, of environmental stress. And, and we can flip that around where it was at last summer where all those cattle died in Southwest Kansas, you know, the same kind of perfect storm, um, uh, low airflow, high temps, high humidity in an area that usually doesn't have low airflow and high airflow and high humidity. And you know, uh, we've seen it. I can think of a producer that actually my family used to do business with the ge this gentleman. Uh, he lost 600 head in one day. Um, you know, it, it was a typical South Dakota farmyard, pretty well surrounded by trees. So the wind was not wind. The wind was low and would have been hard to bet a factor anyway. High humidity, black hided, fat, ready to go. And, you know, they they brought fire trucks in and the whole works and couldn't save them. So that's the part of this that and I think that's partly why then our audience here has been ready to respond with the like, shades and some other things where in other places that perhaps deal with more heat stress. Uh, aren't as apt to um, partly, I think it's because of our, our preference for black cattle, the abrupt change in seasons that we have, and also the recognition of how quickly things can go wrong. And they're looking at it as an insurance policy to make sure it doesn't happen to them. I think this is one of the reasons why my research lab and lots of others are so interested in management or nutritional strategies that we can use to make animals be more resilient to these kind of events, whether it's weaning or trucking stress or heat stress or cold stress and or help with them recover from it more quickly. 
Um, so, you know, you kind of mentioned there too about managers saying that they changed when they fed, did feed deliveries. They probably fed some different storm rations during those kinds of things. So we talked about shade. We talked about bedding. Uh, I did want to reiterate on bedding. I think sometimes people don't think about bedding in the summer. Um, and it's hugely, it, it's potentially even more impactful in the summer in some cases than winter because those cattle don't want to lay down when that ground is hotter than Hades, right? <laughs> right. You know, you've got, you know, you've got some insulation layer. Not only does it reflect um, the radiation off, but you've got the insulation layer between them and that you know, black dirt heat bank. Um, I've seen some drone drone uh, footage of, you know, outdoor yards where they put bedding out and, you know, the cattle just all of a sudden just move right over to it and bed down on it because it's a little bit cooler. Uh, certainly, you know, less, you know, if we think about like, you know, us, you know, we go to the beach, do you lay down on the hot sand or we throw a towel out first? You know, we're going to throw something down there to get between us. And so we're not getting, you know, seared on one side of our body. Our cattle aren't much different. And so, yeah, it, it's a, I, I think part of the challenge is no one likes to really bed cattle. It's time consuming. Uh, you got to have the material. It's expensive, all of those things. But you know, it is something in whether it's cold. You know, we've we've certainly shown the benefit of it in the severe winters from a cold stress standpoint. It plays a role on heat stress as well. Absolutely. And we've talked before when we interviewed Dr. Smith that when Dathan Smirchek was his master's student and now is my PhD student, the running joke in the lab is anytime we look at the weather, we're like, well, it's probably worse in Brookings, <laughs> at least in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a safe bet. Yeah, oddly enough, we're, we've, we're going to have three Canadian graduate students next year. And I sometimes wonder if it's because, um, you know, they're the only part of the world that would look at like, you know, Brookings, South Dakota is probably better weather than home. Let's move there. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm in central Iowa and Kansas City is three, three and a half hours from here. And I swear they are 10 to 15 degrees warmer than us, which is great in February and probably not so great in July. <laughs> yeah, I don't do the heat and humidity well. And so um, uh, I, I'm, I'm fine up here in the summer. Absolutely. Okay, so I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about, you know, I know one of your passions there, especially with the diverse uh, crop and uh, livestock background that you come from is sort of integrating them, right? And so a lot of times we think about that on the cow-calf or stalker side, but let's talk about that a little bit, especially from the feedlot side. So we talked a little bit about, um, in kind of our pre-air discussion about silage and forage use. So I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about some of the things you guys are researching and extending on right now in that area. So uh, one of my PhD projects was we fed um, fed finishing steers two different levels of silage with and without the antigen trait. Um, the antigen part of it, I can make that real short and sweet. We saw no difference, um, but we did see some interesting things from a system standpoint by feeding more silage. Um, I'm not going to shock anyone when I say when we fed went from 12 to 24 percent silage that the cattle gained slower and were less efficient. That's you know, you know, kind of a hello, Captain Obvious moment. But when we did the you know, kind of evaluated that from the standpoint of, well, how many, how many tons of silage would we have produced and, and bushels of corn from a fixed land base and then translated that into how many pounds of beef did we produce? feeding more silage actually produced more pounds of beef under the, that conditions. So if I think about it from an integrated system standpoint, you know, if I am a family farmer feeder and I want to maximize the, you know, trying to capture value from my land base, feeding more corn or more corn silage rather, while that maybe doesn't make my clothes out look as attractive as someone else's does, from the standpoint of how much beef could I sell off of that fixed land base, it actually was the winner. It was also a simpler system to implement. Um, you know, the, our feedlot manager at Beersford said he, you know, he was really glad to see that 12% silage treatment leave the yard uh, because they were harder to hold on feed during the hot summer compared to the cattle that we fed a little more roughage. Uh, and so that's one of the, and I know Dr. Smith had re conducted a similar experiment with one of his other graduate students looking at 15 versus 30 and saw very much the same same trend where on an individual basis uh, didn't look as attractive looks better if we think about it on a beef per acre provided you're willing to feed cattle to the same outweight uh, yeah that 
you know, you're going to have, it doesn't work. I don't know if anything works selling cattle lighter. We have to, you know, the economics of the feedlot business says make them big. And so if that means we feed them just, you know, in our case, we fed them two weeks longer, uh, feeding twice as much silage. So, you know, there are those costs and you, and you have to think about the whole system. You know, if we're, you know, a commercial feedlot that's buying in all of the feed uh, where our metric is going to be how rapidly can we turn the yard over and that manure is an expense item, uh, then that uh, th- that the higher silage system doesn't work as well. If we're looking at, you know, if we're a more integrated system like, you know, your producers in Iowa and mine in South, a lot of mine in South Dakota, uh, then perhaps it makes a little more sense. I also, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that, especially for the producers I work with that pushing the envelope in terms of absolute maximum cattle performance and efficiency is hard to implement and is probably a little riskier than perhaps what the reward is. If I think about all of the things that are going on in their operation that may be running at 95% of maximum or is a better outcome in terms of making sure we're keeping cattle on feed, um, a little safer diets, a little more forgiving. Um, you know, we all heard about Murphy's Law. Murphy camps out and lives on a farm. I mean, he he has built a mansion there. And if I can set up the cattle feeding part of it to deal with Murphy better by maybe feeding a 10% that roughage diet instead of an eight or a 12, um, you know, perhaps I can you know, mitigate some of those risks we talked about. I'm pretty certain it helps us on a heat stress standpoint, just because of metabolic heat load. Uh, it goes against what people think about in terms of heat of fermentation, but and Dr. Mader had done some work where feeding a lower energy diet actually helped those cattle tolerate heat better. It, it, think of it as, you know, we threw a few, one less log in the furnace. Uh, and so, so I think there's some, there's some things Zach and I've been exploring on a roughage standpoint. Our next one we want to look at is um, we've got a lot of folks that are doing the winter annual followed by the summer annual. I want to compare that system to the traditional corn silage system and get at things like weather risk, cost, water use uh, to try to help not to say there's one is better than the other, but I want to be able to give our producers the tools to decide this is what works best for me under these circumstances for these reasons and what happens if this changes or that. So that's some of the things we're looking at doing on the on the roughage side. We've done some work with kernel processing. Um, the short version of that is the recommendations that the dairy industry made don't necessarily hold when we're, especially on finishing beef diets, uh, the res- our responses to kernel processing were non-existent on finishing diets, modest on growing cattle. Gotcha. And is, is that the study that you guys presented at Midwest? I believe so. Yeah. Um, yeah yes, it was. Rise. It was on the growing diets. Um it's sometimes hard to keep track of what we've presented where. (laughs) Well, speaking of presentations, one of the things I was going to ask you about, uh, because it's something I think we've both been interested in recently, there was a presentation at the Plains Nutrition Council meeting in April of this year, where they were talking about rail transportation logistics. And of course, that's one of the beauties of being in our neck of the woods in the Upper Plains, right, where basis is better and things like that. But um, they were talking, that very last slide was the most interesting of the whole presentation, right? And it was a slide where he showed all of the crush plans, all the soybean crush plans that are predicted to come online in the next basically 12 to 16 months, I think he said. So I'll be honest, I'm a young enough feedlot nutritionist that I've never even had to feed corn and urea diets, let alone soybean meal, right? Like I grew up in the distillers era because that's what was always available. Um, and so I think it's time to do some of that research again, right? So you want to tell us a little bit about what you're working on there? Uh, yeah, exactly. And we're, we're, we've been, we're in the middle of our second and third study evaluating soybean meal, uh, as relates to, as a substitute for distillers, because you're right. We've been for at least 20 years and probably longer, uh, you know, a very heavily you know, distillers grain has been our go-to for great reasons, availability, uh, price, uh, you know, it's uh, bunk conditioning, higher rumen undegradable protein, all of those reasons. But 
you know, when I was prepping for this, you, you, you asked for some quotes we liked, and I gave one by Mario Andretti. But another one I like is from Wayne Gretzky, where he talked about, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where it's going. And so that map you referenced uh, in South Dakota, we've, we've added, we always had one, we always had two, we've added a third, and now we're adding a fourth uh, soybean crush facility or expeller type process. So I don't know what's going to shake out in terms of what's going to end up truly being cheaper or not, but it certainly has the potential to change things. So we've conducted one study uh, where we uh, just did a complete substitution of either soy hulls or, or excuse me, soybean meal or soybean meal plus hulls. Uh, in general, it, this certainly worked. There were some odd wrinkles that we need to explore more. Um, it, it appeared that when uh, late in the period, early for the first two thirds, soybean meal was winning. And in the last 28 days, when we fed Optiflex, uh, the distillers ended up catching and maybe passing. Uh, and so I, there's some, those are some things we want to do some more follow-up work on. Uh, right now we're doing um, one study is using uh, expeller processed uh, you know, for the listeners. That is the raw soybeans run through an extruder and then they run it through a press and take out all the free oil they can. And so you're left with a heat treated soybean product with a little bit of residual oil. I'm so old that um I've actually run an extruder. <laughs> that was a, a college summer job I had. Uh, someone that was a bit of a that was a thing in the late eighties uh, that we were going to take raw soybeans and run them through extruders uh, on farm. Um, produce your own. We called it bypass protein back then. Uh, you know, and because the the alternative was urea. Uh, and then once distillers came along, we forgot all about that. And I'm guessing all of those. Ex- uh, extruders probably got sold for scrap metal and yeah but now i'm telling people that you know everything old becomes new again and so we're back to talking about some of those same topics uh the other study that we're working on is we're replacing feeding a blend uh, either distillers or a blend of the two or solely soybean meal um you know there's some things we're gonna you know what we want to try to do with that is to provide some the biological responses to these different ingredients uh, people will ask me does it is it economical or not um, honestly i have no idea uh, depends on what the price of these ingredients are that changes i don't even like to ask answer try to answer that question what i do want to do is be able to then give here is the biological responses we saw that now you can start plugging into your system and determining whether it makes sense or not yeah, absolutely. And the soybean meal thing is so intriguing because we might have a lot of meal and holes available in the area, but then is China going to start buying all of those that soybean meal because they'd rather have that than distillers? And then distillers will be a buy again. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, who knows? I mean, it it could be um, you know, and, and then, you know, and like then you said, or they buy all the soybean meal, and now we're left with all these holes. You know, now what do we do with that? Um, right, which are their own challenge. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> there's opportunity. there's it opportunity. Um, you know, so it's it's a it's an exciting area. You know, and and we're you would think that this is an old topic that there are no unanswered questions, but um, you know, and I know you and I have talked, compared notes. That you saw somewhat of a similar response with soybean meal when op, when the beta agonist was fed that that we saw it. I got really excited with my student uh, running over to your student's poster saying, look at that. We saw the same thing. Now we got to talk about, we got to figure all this out. And it was, <laughs> so I think there's a, some unexplored answers or unexplored questions in that area that um, again, if we end up with uh, some of the people I've talked to have thought, you know, we will be, some of the people I know in the swine industry think they're going to be, we're going to be feeding soybean meal as an energy source in that, in those diets. So. Uh, Just crazy. It's it's even, it, it is. Yeah. Ag, yeah. Absolutely nuts to be thinking about, you know, those kinds of possibilities, but you know, when, you know, when we've got, you know, the, the demand for the soy oil is the one that's driving the bus, you know, the meal becomes a byproduct and that they need to get gone and you know the way you get things gone is drop the price to the point that someone will take it. So we're going to try to be ready to help answer those questions if they come up. 
Absolutely. That's one of the coolest parts about being a research institution and extension operation in the heart of biofuel country, right? There's always something new to test. Oh, yeah. And the variety of different things we get to uh, try. You know, I I mean, we've, it's just, it's fun. And, and the variety of different things people are doing out in the, out in the, in the States, it's uh, no two operations are alike. And that's the part of it that really, I really enjoy. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Warren, we've reached that special time in our interview. It's time for the famous three questions. Are you ready? Ready to go. Okay. So question number one, what is your favorite beef resource? Oh, I don't know if I have a single favorite. I kind of bounce around. I read, I get a couple uh, beef magazine drovers send out their daily email. Uh, there's another marketing source. Uh, I think it's called the beef that I try to read every day. Um, and I also try to go into the the technical and scientific literature, look at translational animal science, general animal science, applied animal science, you know, to try to satisfy the two halves of my brain that uh, on the one side, it's the, uh, I'm still this farm kid with mud on my boots that's trying to think about where's, what's cattle market going to do. And the other side, I'm also supposed to be this PhD scientist that's supposed to know things. And so they get crosswired. But I, so I try to read both, try to, try to gather as much information from various places as I can. So then I can start making some connections and hopefully making some things make sense for people. Awesome. Okay. So question number two is what is something not related to beef that you're reading right now? I'm reading a book and I can't remember the exact title of it. It's in my briefcase. Uh, it's how to be a better college teacher. I, I help Zach and I co-teach our feedlot operations class. I take the lab. He takes the lecture. Um, you know, we talked earlier about no one teaches, no one, we don't learn how to be a mentor. We also don't learn how to be a teacher. Uh, and I've been married to a teacher for 27 years and she hasn't taught me how to be a teacher. So I'm trying to, um, it, it's a bit of a tough, it's a boring read is what it is. So it's, uh, or I haven't been fully engaged in it, but that is something I'm trying to, uh, improve myself a little bit uh, to be a more effective uh, instructor for the undergraduates that take our class. Oh, that's awesome that you're working on that. And I agree. If we didn't intentionally do a teaching certificate or, you know, really get an opportunity to TA a lot of classes or really get to see that modeled for us, it's, it's not that we're inherently bad at it. It's just not natural sometimes to be like, oh, accountability and structure and I need to get things back in a timely fashion. And <laughs> how to remember how to use the D2L website every fall, that sort of thing. And I'm used to giving extension presentations where, you know, and it can be very informal sometimes. And, you know, so a different audience. And I know how to talk to, I know how to talk to 50 year old farmers. Um, 21 year old college students are a different, keeping them engaged, that's a different challenge for me. You know, I would I would challenge you that sometimes they might appreciate that same kind of direction, right? Like some of them really want to see the application. And that's one of the things we miss sometimes in our animal science classes. And that is what I try to bring to the class is I try to bring, you know, all of my all of my background, uh, which, you know, because I I know from that standpoint, I'm a bit unique in terms of animal science faculty that have, you know, done what I've had the opportunity to do. So I bring that, try to bring that to the class. And so far that seemed to have worked, especially as I've learned to bring a little more structure and a little more planning into it. Uh, you know, we're continually to refine that, that class offering and it seems to be working so far. That's awesome. All right. Final question. What is a trait of someone, you know, that has allowed to help allowed them to be successful? Oh, I've got, you know, so many different people that I've, you know, looked up to, but the, maybe the, I'll, I'll throw out Dr. Larry Cora as, you know, he was really my first mentor that wasn't related to me, you know, and he was, and still is this intensely curious individual that, you know, had, you know, he was interested in everything from the genetics of beef production uh, through all the management on the cow calf operation and, and the, through the feedlot, you know, and now he's, you know, probably best known for his work with certified Angus beef, you know, and, and he's now looking at the beef on dairy space as well. Uh, and he, so intensely curious, wide range of interests, but also just a genuine, decent, 
kind, great human being. Um, you know, we we joke that you know he could tell us he could tell a person where to go in such a way that make them look forward to the trip. Uh, you know, and I've I've told in fact I told someone Friday I said I want to be Dr. Cora when I grow up. Uh, that I I try to. I try to remember that. Um, sometimes I fail, but I try to have that same kind of spirit of, you know, helping people. Um, you know, he's who really got me interested in wanting to, wanting to pursue extension as a career. Because I went, well, first I wasn't going to go to grad school in the first place, and I certainly wasn't going to work in extension. And I did both of those, and I now no longer talk about things I won't do because I've. There's almost nothing professionally that I've done that I actually set out to accomplish um, as a goal. It turned into, I mean, I tell people I'm an accidental college professor, PhD. Um, none of this was actually how I had planned out. Well, I think that's a great note to end on, Warren. And uh, absolutely agree. Larry is an excellent um, mentor and definitely a, the epitome of kindness. So, so that's great. Well, this has been so awesome getting to chat with you here today for the Beef Podcast Show. So thanks again, Warren, for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you.